So thank you for joining our November Physics Matter Colloquium. So this is the 37th edition of this live, but virtual scientific expedition, transcending the frontier of knowledge. So like last month, so we have traveled back in time, so to the paleontological epoch, and all of that thanks to particle accelerator. So this uh, open colloquia series is prepared by the Forum on International Physics, the FIP, which is a voluntary association of the American Physical Society members, the APS. So uh, those members are interested in advancing the knowledge of physics and its diffusion. So by fostering cooperation and communication among physicists and among uh, public of all countries. So visit our webpage uh, where you will find uh, so the previous colloquia recording who has stored, and then you will learn more why physics matter. So this month, uh, we accelerate science and society. So thanks to Professor Carson Welsh. So as panelists, so my name is uh, Christine Darv. I'm an uh, um, engineering scientist at the European Spallation Source, so in Sweden, the ESS, and I'm the current chair of uh, the FIP. And with me, so my colleague, former chair as well, so Alan Hurd from Los Alamos Laboratory. Uh, so last, uh, last month, we had Professor Phil Manning, who had the opportunity to show as well this short trailer appetizer. And we did the same, so this time. And those little trailers were prepared in the framework of a MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, supported by the European Commission grant, Accelerate Your Teaching. So our two famous scientific actors, so who are role models for the future generation, are now so on our physics uh, matters platform. So I will describe so the curricula of um, so uh, Carson Ross, a professor full term, a professor of physics at the University of Liverpool. So he's a member of uh, Science and Technology Facility Council, the SCFC Council. So he's also the head of uh, Liverpool Accelerator Science Cluster Base at uh, the Krokov Institute. He's director of the two STFC Center for the doctoral training in uh, data intensive science, so the live data and the live ino, and coordinator of the Pan European Expraxia doctoral network. So Professor Welsh studied physics and economics at the UC Berkeley in the US and in the Goethe University in Frankfurt, so in Germany, so where he completed his PhD in 2002. So following his postdoctoral fellowship at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Endelberg, so he was also completed this in collaboration with CERN. So he established then his Pan-European Quetzal Group in 2007, and he was appointed as reader at the University of Liverpool in 2008, promoted to full professor in physics 2011, and served as head of physics department between 16 and 23. And during, uh, so under that leadership, so Liverpool physics uh, became one of the UK top physics department. So a lot of accomplishment for Professor Wills, who is specialized in the design and optimization of particle accelerator and light source with a focus on development and underpinning technology, in particular beam diagnostic technique and data science. So his research includes study into high energy collider, antimatter research, medical application, as well as investigation into novel high gradient accelerator. So he has been a partner in numerous national and international research projects and coordinator of uh, more than 10 EU projects, including a large number of uh, multinational research network. And he's member also of numerous international, so advisory program committee, international workshop and conference. So a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, quality that we will hear now. So after this uh, short introduction where we will keep uh, the answer to the question for the end, and then uh, we will get possibility for you as well to write down. So any of those questions uh, in uh, the little icon where you see question and answer. And uh, so now, so then Professor West, so the floor is yours. Huh? Yeah, thank you very much, Christine, for the kind introduction and, and welcome everybody. Um, and thanks for joining this afternoon. Um, as Christine said, my uh, passion is into particle accelerators. 
And uh, that is an interesting technology which has been around for a very long time, but where uh, surprisingly the media coverage is normally not very extensive. So very few people really know in some level of details what things uh, uh, particle accelerators have done for the world. So this afternoon, I'm going to try and shine some light um, onto this area and explain to you some of the applications that particle accelerators um, have opened over the years. And I'm sure there will be a few surprises. And I think that will give us a good basis for discussions towards the end of the colloquium then. So let me share my screen so that you can see this. So, yeah. So, accelerators for science and society. Um, I suppose when someone asks you about particle accelerators, the first thing that springs to mind are the very large atom smashers. So, these are the machines like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where we bring subatomic particles uh, to the speed of light and then we smash them together. And that gives us an insight into the very origins of nature. Fundamentally, that is something like a time machine where we can travel all the way back to the Big Bang itself, so 13.6 billion years ago, and unleash particles and study them that we have not seen set free since that time. Uh, so that's probably one of the most mind-blowing um, examples. And this slide here shows a simulation of the Higgs field, uh, the latest particle that was discovered in the Large Hadron Collider, uh, now just a little bit more than a decade ago, after more than four decades of research that went into testing whether the theoretical understanding we had of nature was right. Beyond um, atom smashers, there are many, many more applications of particle accelerators. And I'm sure some of those you will not, not have heard of. In fact, at the moment, there is more than 50,000 particle accelerators around the world. And they are used for material sciences in hospital settings. They're used for food sterilization and a very large number of other applications. So we will look into some of these and I'll take you through what is required uh, to understand what particle accelerators have done for the world. Now, talking about the world, um, I think it's fair to say that the world around us is constantly uh, changing. Um, just a, a few thousand years ago, when people uh, thought about the world, they thought that it's uh, essentially a disk. And in fact, some people still do. Uh, but we know better because we observed further. We took a step back and we realized uh, that the the world is in, in indeed a sphere. And initially, people thought the sun would orbit around this Earth until they observed further and they found that the Earth is in fact part of a solar system and it is the earth that is moving around uh, the sun now today we know that there is so much more we know that uh, the universe is an immense space and the thing is in in order to understand nature at these very large these cosmic scales we have to go all the way back uh, to the very beginning and look into the building bricks the things that make up everything and that takes us to the tiny particles that like Lego bricks really make the world around us. So particle accelerators are something like a microscope. They are a big hammer that allow us to smash particles together, break them up into their building bricks and uh, let us look into the details of the structure of matter. Now, to see how we are doing this, I'm going to take you on a journey, not to the end of the cosmos, uh, but just on a two-hour flight here from Liverpool down to Geneva in Switzerland. And that's where CERN is based, the European Laboratory for uh, Particle Physics. And CERN is one of the world's largest scientific experiments at the same time. What you see on this slide is an illustration of CERN in the area around Geneva. What you see on the right hand side of the slide is Lake Geneva, the dark blue area. That's Europe's one of one of Europe's largest lakes. You can also see the airport in Geneva. Uh, so you get an idea of scale. The Large Hadron Collider is a very large circle that's illustrated here. And it is a ginormous machine, 27 kilometers in circumference, buried 100 meters underneath the ground. It stretches um, between Switzerland and France, so it, the particles cross different countries uh, on their journey. And it is an instrument to study the building bricks of nature and to understand the forces that act between them. 
the way this is done is via uh, a number of experiments that are part of this machine. And four of these experiments are illustrated here. At the top, you see CMS, the compact muon solenoid. You see ELIS, which is a heavy ion acceler uh, a heavy ion experiment. You see LHDB, uh, which is a, a forward uh, particle looking um, experiment. And you see ATLAS, the largest of the experiments at CERN, uh, looking into new particles. And uh, fundamentally, what's happening at CERN is that particles go on a journey and I'm going to take you through the accelerator chain. It all starts with a bottle of hydrogen that's shown here, um, where hydrogen uh, molecules are split into protons and these protons are accelerated. First via a linear accelerator that is then injecting into a circular accelerator and the particles are gaining more and more energy. Similar to the gear shift in your car, you need several accelerators to reach maximum energy. So changing from one accelerator to the next really is like shifting up uh, the gears in your car and accelerating further and further. At CERN, this is done via a chain of accelerators. You saw the uh, PS, the PS booster. Here's a super proton synchrotron, which is already more than a kilometer in circumference. And from there, it goes all the way into the Lord of the Rings, the Large Hadron Collider, the largest particle accelerator in the world. And here you have two beams that are um, moving in opposite directions. And once they have been accelerated to the maximum energy, which is seven tera electron volts in the case of the LHC, they are being smashed together. And in that moment, uh, lots of things happen. Things that sometimes we cannot predict. So we do not know exactly what comes out of these experiments. And that's then the magic, that's the hard work that has to happen in these particle detectors where one of them is depicted in this illustration. You see that the particles, they are being smashed together at the very center of the detector. And then very much like an onion structure, there's one detector after the other, every single one responsible for identifying one specific type of particles. And by measuring all of these particles, by measuring their trajectories, we know exactly what particles were produced, what their energies are, and in which directions they are flying. And by knowing all of this information, uh, we can reconstruct exactly what happened in the collision and what the outcome was. And sometimes we get a surprise. Sometimes we get a particle that has either an unknown mass or there are energy signatures that do not really make sense. And that's how we make discoveries. Uh, and in the case of the Higgs boson, that's exactly the kind of quest that was ongoing where theory predicted a, a particle that should exist at a certain energy. And the LHC was built, amongst other things, to really identify that particle and prove that the theory was correct. And that happened, um, as I said, now um, roughly a decade ago at CERN and is the last step, the latest step, um, rather, in the chain of uh, scientific discovery and understanding the universe in terms of the particles that make up everything. Now, these installations are very large. I mean, you can tell from the Large Hadron Collider, 27 kilometers in circumference is a very, very big machine, even if you travel at the speed of light. But also the detectors are enormous. Shown here is a photograph that was taken in the early stages of the ATLAS detector. Uh, in the very center of the slide, you can see the standard scientist standing there as a size reference. And I think you get an idea of scale of just how large uh, these infrastructures are. In fact, the cavern in which Atlas is built um, is large enough to, ho to house uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris in its entirety. So a very large underground cavern that was purposely built to, to house a particle physics experiment and really, um, and really an, ex an excellent result um, made possible by international collaboration. So these detectors, they are used um, to reconstruct these trajectories between particles, to identify particles, to measure the energies of these particles, and then to ultimately find new physics. And that's really what they are based, what they are built for, uh, to take us further, to take us beyond what, what, what we already know. Now, what these detectors also do is they produce a vast amount of data. In fact, so much data that no single institution in the world could process all of the data. Uh, so processing data, handling data, analyzing data um, is becoming an increasing challenge. And one of the projects that we are 
um, carrying out at the moment is looking looking exactly into that. And Christine mentioned that briefly in her introduction. Live Inno um, is a center for doctoral training lo that looks into innovation in data intensive science. What you can see here is a logo of the, the center, which at the moment trains around 40 PhD students. And the little icons that you see flying around, they illustrate the diversity of research that is impacted by data science here at Liverpool. Starting from the top, we have condensed metaphysics, followed by particle physics. Accelerator science is depicted via the electrostatic quadrupole symbol. There's nuclear physics, astrophysics, and there's also mathematics and computer science. And all of these research disciplines, they combine forces in order to tackle the next generation of problems related to data science. So we really need scientists, engineers, experts from a variety of different disciplines to make the most out of data. And for particle physics research, where such huge amount of data are being produced on a daily basis, that is absolutely crucial. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is not at all limited to accelerator applications and particle physics experiments. Data science is now everywhere, whether it's used for face ID, whether it's used in your satellite navigation system, or whether it's used for weather forecast. We really have data science and machine learning techniques all the way to AI. I'm sure many of you are using ChatGPT uh, to help you in your daily work and study. Uh, all of these different areas have computer and data science now um, in the core. Now, in the case of particle accelerators and the analysis of data coming from particle physics experiments, uh, we rely on grid computing. So uh, the grid is a distributed computing infrastructure where uh, different centers all around the world are all interconnected and they all work together to make sense of the vast amount of data that is produced in very large scale particle physics experiments, such as the ones at CERN. You can see one of the... the Key features of modern research is that we need to collaborate. We need to work together over country uh, boundaries and over discipline boundaries in order to get the most out of our research and also to drive science and innovation. Uh, so data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques to analyze data, all of these come together almost naturally by combining accelerator science with the quest for new particle physics discoveries at the high energy end. Now, we don't necessarily always need um, high energies to do exciting science. You can also do fascinating science at the very opposite end of the spectrum, for example, with very low energy antimatter particles. Now, antimatter is exciting. Um, I'm sure you all have a flavor of what antimatter is about through popular science fiction um, films like Star Trek um, or, or others. And, um, and here at Liverpool, we have been leading uh, an international consortium looking specifically into low energy antimatter physics questions. Uh, one of the projects that I've had the pleasure of leading is the project AVA, which stands for Accelerators Validating Antimatter Physics. And depicted here is a collision between an antiproton and a neon atom. Uh, they The two collide at very, very low energies. And then there's loads of fragments that are being produced. And similarly to the traces that you saw before, uh, at low energies, we are trying to make sense of these traces and then to reconstruct what is going on in the experiment. Now, as I said, you, you may have an understanding or at least an idea of what antimatter is because it is so often used in Hollywood, but how do we actually produce antimatter? What is a cooking recipe uh, to create a single antiproton? Now, here is how it works. We take an intense beam of high energy protons and we fire that beam onto a block of metal. Uh, that really is just a block of metal. It's uh, typically iridium as a target. And when the beam of protons hits that target, it produces all sorts of other particles. The reason for that is probably the most um, known equation in physics, which is the famous E equals mc squared equation. What that equation says is that energy is equivalent to the mass of a particle times the velocity of light squared. Now, the equation doesn't say anything about the mass, uh, the type of particle that is being produced, it only states that the energy corresponds to mass. So when we are firing 
um, a beam of protons onto a block of metal, we put a lot of energy into one place. And that means we can create a whole range of particles with different masses. And amongst these particles, also some antiparticles. And what's shown here um, is an illustration of one of these antiparticles. Now, the interesting thing about antiparticles is that they are produced with a very, very low probability. When we fire one million protons onto this block of metal, on average, we only get one single antiproton out of that collision. We also produce a lot of other particles in the process. So in that explosion, there's all sorts of particles flying in all different directions. And the first thing we need to do is we need to clean up that mess. We need to extract the antiprotons that we are really interested in and then do uh, guide them to, through a set of magnetic and electric fields and capture only those particles that we are really interested in. And that's exactly what we are doing at CERN. So we are firing the high energy proton beam onto a block of metal. With a very low probability, we create antiprotons. And typically what we are doing is we are firing 10 to the 13 protons onto the target and we get 10 million antiprotons out of this per shot. And a shot typically is done every two minutes. So only 10 million particles every two minutes is a usual production rate. To do the experiments then with these particles is extremely difficult because you need to capture the particles to do studies with them. Fundamentally, what you would like to do is you would like to compare the meta world with the antimatter world. Now, the meta world, we know very precisely and we can do lots of experiments the problem with antimatter is the moment it touches any matter, the antimatter particle annihilates into a burst of light with 100% efficiency. So take one antiproton and you bring it in contact with any matter particle, it goes off into sheer light and is, it, it disappears. So the one thing we need to make sure is that the antiparticles do not touch anything whatsoever. And that's done by using particle traps. A particle trap is an enclosure a metallic vacuum chamber where there's almost perfect vacuum inside, better than outer space, almost no particles inside of that chamber whatsoever. Because remember, the moment our antiparticle touches anything, it goes away. So we evacuate that vacuum chamber, leave nothing in it, and then we introduce a magnetic and electric field in order to make sure that our antiprotons, which have, a, which have a singly negative charge, stay in the same position over very long periods. And this was enabled or, or made much easier um, just a few years ago by the introduction of the extra low energy storage ring at CERN called ELENA. So in ELENA, we can decelerate these antiprotons, we can cool them, we can make them, bring them almost to rest and inject them into an iron trap, which is shown here. Um, and inside of this iron traps, the, the particles, they can be contained, they move back and forth, but they're not touching anything. And that's when we can then start doing precision experiments. And that, that's what colleagues across a number of collaborations have done. They have uh, carried out measurements into spectroscopy of the anti-hydrogen um, atom. They have most recently uh, dropped um, antimatter in the gravitational field of the Earth and have observed for the first time experimentally that Newton's anti-apple also falls down in the gravitational field of the Earth rather than going up. So a lot of exciting research that can be done with very low energy antiparticles. Now, is that exotic research only? Can we only do fundamental research with these kind of particles? Absolutely not. There are real world applications, for instance, Antimatter is used on a daily basis in almost every hospital for positron emission tomography. And what's happening here is that a radioactive isotope is injected into a patient. It is then distributed in the body. And when the ra radioactive decay happens, an electron and a positron, which is the antiparticle of the electron, are emitted at an angle of exactly 180 degrees. And they are also emitted at one very precise energy, which is 511 kilo electron volt. So by detecting these two particles, we can trace back where they came from inside the body of the patient. And that tells us where that radioactive substance is. And if we do that in an organ which is working, we can find out something about the functioning principle of that organ. And we can detect how that patient um, uh, whether there's anything wrong with the patient, how we can possibly treat it. 
Now, staying a little bit um, with um, medical applications, that is actually an area which is also extremely important um, when it comes to potential use of particle accelerators. Shown here is a modern treatment room at a facility called Metaustron in Austria. And that is a facility that treats patients with proton ions, um, so singly charged ions that are uh, used in order to treat um, a patient. Now, the question is, why would you use proton beams in order to treat cancer um, and not um, more conventional um, and not do more conventional therapy such as X-ray therapy or electron beam therapy. Now, on this slide, what I'm going to show you is you, uh, visualized by a physicist. So uh, you may be surprised how different you look to a physicist. On the X-axis, axis, you find your body, uh, which is the depths in water, because fundamentally the human body is 95% water. And we see um, a depth inside of that human body all the way up to 30 centimeters. And if you just look at yourself and you look at yourself from different angles, you will realize that with 30 centimeters, distance, you can reach almost any kind, any area inside of your body. Now imagine that, unfortunately, you develop some kind of localized tumor inside your body. What you would want is that the radiation used to treat that tumor reaches into that area and can destroy the tumor. On the y-axis of this plot, you see the dose or the energy which is deposited at the location of the tumor. And just to have a look at the different options that are available to us for cancer treatment, let us start with the one radiation type that you are probably all familiar with, um, and that's X-rays. X-rays are used routinely. Um, the moment you have a bike accident or ski accident, uh, you will be sent to a hospital and a doctor takes an X-ray image of you and then they will see whether you have fractured your, uh, your leg or, or arm and then uh, do um, the corresponding treatment. Now, fundamentally, the, the uh, relationship between the energy deposited and the depths in your body for x-rays is shown here. So we deposit a lot of energy at the very beginning, at skin level, and then you have a sort of exponential decay. And after 20, 25 uh, cent centimeters, you will see that the relative dose compared to the maximum peak is only around 20% or so. So just a, a, a small fraction of the energy initially getting into your body actually reaches the area that we are really interested in treatment if we are assuming a tumor that is located at, at the depths of maybe 20 or 25 centimeters. So x-rays can reach a tumor, but they are maybe not ideal because they are simply depositing too much or at least a lot of energy into other areas of the body where it's not really needed. So what about other types of particles? You may have heard about electron beam therapy. Electrons can be very easily produced. They are cheap um, and they can um, be produced in very compact accelerators. Now for electrons, the curve looks a little bit different. So shown here are 20 million volt um, electrons and they also deposit a lot of energy at the very beginning, but then there's a very short drop and after 12, 13 centimeters, there's almost no energy left. So imagining again our tumor at a depth of 20, 25 centimeters, it fundamentally means that electrons cannot even reach that tumor, let alone treat it. So electrons are really not an option for that kind of envisaged treatment. And that brings us to protons and heavy ions. And for that, we have that final red curve here, which I've highlighted in red um, in the plot. And you see that here, the characteristics is fundamentally very, very different. We deposit a very low energy level only at the beginning when we enter into the patient's body. And then for the first 20 centimeters or so, we stay constantly at this low energy level. And then all of a sudden, at a distance, which is directly determined by the energy of the incoming beam, we deposit almost all of the energy in, uh, in, a, in one go. And then we have a very sharp de decrease in the energy that's left in the beam. So almost a perfect bullet, if you like, if you're thinking about targeting a tumor that is inside the body of a patient. 
So proton beam therapy is that kind of magic bullet that allows you to almost teleport to the location of your tumor cells, destroy the tumor and not affect the healthy tissue. And that really is a game changing therapy for some cancer types. Um, obviously cancers that uh, are very clearly localized um, and that are also typically deep inside the body of the patient where classical surgery or other types of radiation find it more difficult to reach to. Now, how does that relate to the particle physics accelerators that we've seen earlier? Well, in fact, the same technology that is used at CERN is also used in these clinical settings. Doing the same journey again, we start with an ion source, we go through a linear accelerator, and first we go into a circular accelerator that is depicted here. Once we've, re received, when, once we've reached the treatment energy with which we want to treat the patient, we go via a beam line that's shown here, and a gantry that is moving around the patient. And then we irradiate the patient from the angle um, with exactly the beam energy that we will require. In these facilities, there are typically different treatment rooms uh, where several uh, patients can be treated in parallel, um, all the way to very large installations for heavy ions where the gantry um, is a several hundred ton monster that is moving um, around the patient who doesn't see any of this uh, infrastructure. The patient doesn't realize that there's an entire building with an accelerator and a beam delivery system around them. All they do is they lay down uh, for something like 10, 15 minutes, they receive that treatment, and then they come up for uh, several of these treatment stints, um, and that allows to take out the tumor. It has been extremely successful for some tumor types, especially brain tumors in children or, or for treating prostate cancer, and is one of the most advanced treatment methodologies that is available at the moment, all based on the same technology that is used for very high energy atom smashers. Now here at Liverpool, um, we had um, a, a very major role in that kind of development. Um, I had the pleasure of coordinating a pan-European project into the optimization of medical accelerators or OMA. And OMA looked into the next step in that kind of treatment modality. How can we make these accelerators even better? How, we ca how can we diagnose the beams that we deliver to the patient even better? And how can we conceive future treatment facilities on the basis of existing and future technologies? Now, in the abstract to this colloquium, I mentioned that I will also um, say a few words about how these kind of technologies can be communicated um, to different audiences. And especially uh, the cancer therapy treatment here um, is one area that can be connected very nicely uh, with iconic Hollywood, fi Hollywood films um, and television series. And the one example that I would like to bring is um, the related to proton therapy. Now in proton therapy, um, you fire a bunch of protons through an accelerator, you guide them via electric and magnetic fields, and then you eventually bring them to exactly the position inside the patient's body where you want to destroy the tumor. Now, does that sound familiar? I'm pretty sure it does, because there is a very, very famous film where a proton therapy is guided by an invisible force and that helps to destroy something which is very bad. Have a look here. Now, in the very first Star Wars film from 1977, that was exactly what Luke Skywalker did. He fired a proton torpedo into the Death Star, guided it via the Force, and then destroyed the bad thing, the Death Star in this case. And the analogy uh, to what we are doing today with proton beam therapy couldn't be any closer. So I've used Star Wars to connect with audiences from around the world over the years. You see uh, Lord Vader himself here visiting our diagnostics lab, looking into a next generation beam monitor used for clinical purposes. Um, and we use Star Wars to explain how accelerators 
are helping to understand and also shape the world around us. We have developed a large number of demonstrations um, around physics of Star Wars. So here you see a photograph of um, different Star Wars characters uh, visiting my institute, the Cockroft Institute in the northwest of England. Uh, we had uh, demonstrations, uh, displays with Lego Star Wars set um, to uh, fascinate a younger audience. Um, and we turned the entire campus uh, here into a campus from a galaxy not so far, far away. And we explained the science that we are doing. The way that we did this was through hands-on demonstrations. The demonstration you see here in the center is one that you all will be probably familiar with. It's that fundograph generator where you are put your hands onto the generator and then your hair stands up and you can also send some kind of lightning towards your neighbor if they come too close. And that's exactly um, what uh, Emperor Palpatine was doing in Star Wars. So the connection between that kind of field and the uh, field breakdown in Star Wars is extremely close. Another example is shown here. We have developed software that explain plasma accelerators um, a new generation of accelerator technology, and we allowed school children from the northwest of England to come and to test this kind of software. And finally, um, another demonstration involved superconductivity. And here we explained how superconducting cables, superconducting magnets are really part of modern accelerators and how they allow us to transport very high current and to generate very high fields. We also had posters at these events about our research. So all Savos seemed, they explained how we bend a beam in an accelerator. They also explained how we use uh, different forces to accelerate and guide particles in an accelerator. So you can see that uh, with the theme of Star Wars, you can explain a lot of cutting edge science and that has turned out to be very successful. In fact, we have developed a number of resources for teachers. Um, science in School is a European journal for science teachers. And I've written four articles um, in that magazine that talks about our research, but from a perspective of Star Wars and where teachers are given a number of hands-on example demonstrations they can use in their classroom in order to explain physics concepts, engineering concepts to their students. All of these are freely available for download. So if you're interested later on, have a look at these resources. Now, moving away from Star Wars to um, maybe the next generation of accelerators, um, as I said before, at the moment, the world's largest and highest energy accelerator is the Large Hadron Collider. The question is, can we maybe make this accelerator even better in the future? And the answer is yes. There is already an international effort that's being undertaken into upgrading the LHG and to make it even better in the future. And that project is called the High Luminosity LHG. It's a critical update which will improve the quality of the beam by roughly a factor of 10. And that will allow us to do much more precise, much better experiments than we can do it at the moment. One of the things that is key for understanding the beam in the machine is to measure the beam. Now, that's not easy um, because at very high energies, pretty much anything that you put into the path of the beam will immediately be destroyed because it's, it's so powerful that it will burn through um, any sheet of metal or anything that you could imagine. So the technology that we have developed in my group is based on a supersonic gas jet, uh, which we generate and which is used to measure the beam. The principle is shown here. We expand a gas into vacuum, we shape it into a thin curtain, and this thin gas curtain is then used to analyze the primary particle beam. The following video shows that in a little bit more detail and is exactly how it's installed in the Large Hadron Collider at the moment. Shown here are these white pulses, and this is the main proton beam in the LHC orbiting around the 27 kilometer machine. And the red curtain gas jet is shown here. So when these two collide, when the white proton beam goes through the gas curtain, what happens is that light is generated. And this light is projected onto a camera system. This happens under an angle of 45 degrees. And this allows us to measure the beam profile in the LHC two-dimensionally without really affecting the beam because the gas jet is so thin that the LHG beam doesn't even feel that we are measuring it, yet we get all the information about the beam that we want. 
Now, over time, we have developed different versions of this gas jet. We have started off um, with something which actually targeted very low energy antiprotons. So you can see the connection here in terms of the different research areas. We have then built a test system here at the Cockroft Institute around five years ago together with colleagues from CERN and from GSI in Germany. And we have demonstrated that this kind of concept can work in principle. And more recently, we have developed a much more compact version of this monitor, which was shipped to CERN. It was integrated into the machine last year. And this year, we have taken the first measurements with both protons and heavy ions. And we have shown that we can measure the LHC beam with very good precision um, and also in a parameter range that no other monitor at the moment can measure the beam. So a great success and uh, the result of a collaboration between different institutions, countries, and many staff and students contributing to it. Now, looking into the future, and I suppose that's what we are always doing in science, the question is always, where are we going next? And is there maybe a next evolution step in accelerators? Now, one of the fundamental limitations in accelerators is that we can only ever uh, realize an accelerating gradient that is um, that goes up to a certain amount. And the reason for that is very simple and fundamental. If we take two plates of metal and we separate them by some distance and we slowly increase the voltage, at some point, what will always happen is that we get a spark across these two metal electrodes. And that means a breakdown of the field and our field collapses. We cannot have any acceleration anymore. That limitation is very fundamental, and it means we cannot realize accelerating gradients of more than a few hundred million volts per meter. It is technically not possible to do this by using radio frequency technology. Now, do we know maybe any principles, any concepts that have accelerating gradients that are much higher? And the answer to this is yes. If we look at the sun, for example, um, we can see that there are um, very, very high gradients, very high potential differences in a plasma, which is the sun. And maybe the idea is how can we capitalize this technology? Now, in a plasma accelerator, exactly that is happening. In a plasma accelerator, we have a beam pulse, which is depicted here, that moves through a lake of plasma, and it generates these kind of waves that you can see in this illustration. Let's have a look again. We have a laser or beam pulse that is a white spot moving across a plasma, and it creates these peaks uh, in the plasma. And these peaks are analogous um, to very high electric fields. And if we then inject an electron beam into that plasma at the right time, we can boost the energy of that electron beam very, very strongly with a gradient that is much higher than what can be achieved in a conventional accelerator. And one of the projects looking into that is Eupraxia. Eupraxia is a distributed research infrastructure which is being uh, built at the moment across Europe, um, many different countries. And the purpose of that accelerator is to really unleash the power of plasma and to build an, a plasma accelerator with industry quality beam. Now, um, important goals must have smart targets. Uh, that means specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely targets. And probably the most um, well-known smart target of all times um, was stated by John F. Kennedy uh, back in the 60s when he said that this nation should commit itself to achieve the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. So that is a very specific time period. It's a very specific target namely bringing somebody to the moon and also returning them safely to Earth. Um, and that is probably the most, uh, smart, the most known smart target of all times. Now, for plasma accelerators, um, we have uh, a similar smart target in the past that was defined by these three people here. That's Rutherford in the center and then Cockcroft and Walton, all Nobel laureates. And at the time, what they said is what we require is a machine that gives us a potential difference of the order of 10 million volts, which can be safely accommodated in a reasonably sized room. And we also require an accelerating tube that can withstand that vol voltage. And we think that's absolutely possible. And that was the birth of particle accelerators. That was the roadmap that was the smart target for particle accelerators just a century um, fr uh, from now. Um, just a century ago, and basically just down the road from here in Manchester, half an hour drive. 
Now for plasma accelerators, we also have such a smart target now. And what we say is what we require is a laser capable of delivering pulses with 100 femtosecond per second duration at an energy of 100 joule and a repetition rate of up to 100 hertz. So 100 cube challenge, if you like. And that is something that the plasma accelerator community strives for. Now, the, the latest uh, generation um, of researchers in that particular area are doctoral candidates that are being trained within the Eupraxia Doctoral Network, which I'm coordinating from INFN in Italy. Um, and this network really looks into unleashing the power of plasma and taking us to the next step in accelerator technology. Are there other things that are exciting, that are novel, that are, are being investigated at the moment? Again, the answer is yes, and that is a nice is yes, and the and that is a nice thing about science that we can really uh, we can think about things that a few years ago we thought are absolutely impossible. Why not absolutely miniaturize accelerator and build a micro accelerator that can fit on the tip of your finger, as illustrated here? So these dielectric laser accelerators, uh, they are structures that are being investigated at the moment. We use um, uh, structures that are uh, produced in dedicated labs and then powered by a laser rather than a radio frequency field. And again, in these kind of structures, we can realize extremely high gradients, much higher than in conventional accelerators. And this might be another next generation of accelerators very, very compact, and uh, that can make us dream of, for example, very, very compact light sources, much better than anything we have available at the moment. So accelerators um, are uh, an ideal tool to not only accelerate science, but also to accelerate innovation uh, for everything we are doing, collaboration across disciplines, across countries is absolutely key in order to get the best scientific results. Now, as Christine mentioned, I'm based here at the Cockroft Institute in the northwest of England, where we conduct accelerator research. The entire building that we are based on does accelerator science. There's around 250 people, um, mechanical, vacuum, electric engineers, scientists, physicists, all sorts of different disciplines. And they all try to make accelerators um, available for science and society. And you can see that in both science and society, there is CI, and CI is how we normally abbreviate the Cockroft Institute. So the Cockroft Institute really very central for both science and society. Uh, that brings me to the end of this uh, short overview and uh, coming back to the theme of Star Wars, as Yoda would say it, um, much to learn we still have. So you've seen that there are lots of ideas that are being studied at the moment. Uh, what it does need in every single case is, is new ideas, fresh minds that come up with solutions to technical and scientific challenges. And that means you uh, who are connected today. Uh, so hopefully I could, uh, I could share some of the open questions with you. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, just share that final screen here with you so you can have a look at my research group and then uh, look forward to answering any questions that you may have. So thanks a lot for this uh, global overview of what we can do. I mean, a lot of the things that we can do with a particle accelerator, so we can complement with the questions, certainly. So, um, and all those different uh, analogies are very important, the way to motivate as well the younger generation. I think you have exactly the the key element with um, Hollywood or any kind of uh, analogy with Star Trek, for instance. And uh, the diversity, I think it's really important as well to show the diversity and what uh, uh, the, the global public that can be reached. So thanks to all of uh, those particle accelerators. So thanks a lot. So um, the question and uh, so in the question and answer, so you can ask a question. We see that some maybe as well uh, be available in the chat. Uh, and uh, we have as well some um, of the speaker. We see Erkan. Erkan have also for the light source, so the scattering community. So I, I would like also indeed to come back to that. Maybe could uh, we let Erkan speak, if you don't mind, um, before we take the question? Oh. I think it could be good. So I allow you, Erkan, to speak. Thank and you. Really nice can to you see you. Me? We can hear you. 
Excellent. Can I ask a question? But thank you for this beautiful presentation. I was very excited to see uh, from the experts. But I'm a synchrotron scientist, and there are equally exciting developments in synchrotron radiation sources from the accelerator point of view. Would you like to comment on them as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, as I said at the beginning, the disclaimer is that accelerators are used in so many different areas that unfortunately 45 minutes doesn't allow me to cover everything. But but I, I'll take your question as an opportunity to, to say a few words about light sources in general. So synchrotron radiation sources have probably been one of the most successful um, accelerators that have opened up to much broader communities, user communities and only the particle physicist. Synchrotron radiation sources are where you store a beam of electrons over an extended period of time. And what that beam does is it emits synchrotron radiation on an ongoing basis. The beauty about that radiation is it's monochromatic, it's very high quality, and you can use it to study biological systems, you can use it to treat materials, you can use it to make possible entirely new materials via these radiation sources. That is one type of light source that is based on particle accelerators, Beyond that, there are also free electron lasers, which are kind of the next generation um, of, of light sources and also dedicated user facilities where the idea is that you actually move away from using the particles as such to be the experiment, but you use an electron to produce a very high quality ray of light. And that light is then can be used very much like the flashlight in a camera uh, to take very high resolution videos actually today um, of biological systems. So when you if you've ever seen um, an animation of a protein unfolding, for example, then most likely that is the result of a measurement that was done at a synchrotron light source or free electron laser that really looks into the dynamics of these principles. So a very, very important uh, area of application and an area where I could easily talk 45 minutes about just synchrotron radiation sources. So many thanks for bringing that up. And sorry, I cannot prevent as well coming as well to do neutron science and all the different uh, accelerator driven as well neutron source uh, like respiration. So if you can also in uh, just short words summarize those capacity and the advantage yeah. of hydrogen. Yeah, so a uh, very, very important uh, point. And uh, I thought that Christine might say this, um, given that this is her home base. Um, so um, kind of similar to what I mentioned um, in the production mechanisms for antiprotons, you can use a primary beam to create some other particles that have very exciting properties. And a neutron source is one of these principles where you use a very high energy, a very high intensity proton beam that you fire onto a target. And from that target, you create um, a, a directional beam of neutrons. Now, neutrons are very interesting because they are electrically neutral and they can, uh, they can analyze materials, they can treat materials and allow experiments in ways that no other particle can do. So the European spallation source or the national spallation source in the US, um, the spallation neutron source in the US, they are facilities uh, where exactly that is happening. So dedicated facilities where the proton beam is only a means to an end. The proton beam is only used to then create the particle that you're really interested in, which are the neutrons. And the European spallation source is the latest stage in European research infrastructures, which is being uh, constructed at the moment and will be uh, giving insights and, and allow access to a whole range of new experiments. Again, something that could easily fill an entire colloquium. Exactly. And for that, maybe I will put a little advertisement as well for this MOOC, a Massive Open Online course to accelerate your teaching, where we have summarized as well the broad range as well of capacity for particle accelerator and as well the user case. I think the user case are important. Discovery, this is tools for discovery. So synchrotron and uh, light source, but also the neutron source. For sure. And as you said, so the big physics and the big science is what drives 
the visibility as well of particle accelerator with CERN. So this is how you started. So uh, related to that, we have a question from uh, uh, Joanna Lewis, so who is as well involved so with uh, this MOOC accelerator teaching where you are one of the actors as well. Uh, so I just uh, read her question. So uh, why is it easier to build a giant expansive particle accelerator first? And then the miniaturization of them with laser is only now being done. Nice question. Yeah, very, very, very good question. And, and let me let me just underline and, and stress what you said about the massive open online course that was developed and what a fantastic resource it is. Um, what I said at the very beginning is that unfortunately there is very little knowledge about how accelerators function. And if any of you do a Google search, there isn't a, a great deal of materials available uh, to the general public, um, how they can easily learn about what accelerators are doing. Now the MOOC, the Massive Open Online course is a way for everybody uh, to learn more than just the basics to actually get a quite good understanding of how these accelerators tick. So I would recommend uh, that you have a look at this fantastic resource and, and many, many thanks to all the colleagues who have contributed to that. It really is a, a fantastic new opportunity. Now to the question. Okay. Um, so it... <laughs> So to the first part of the question, so it, it has never been easy to build uh, these giant particle smashers. These are massive um, international global collaborations, uh, very often pushing the technologies to absolute limits. Now, uh, the fact that a plasma can sustain very high voltages and gradients, that was known for a long time. Uh, but to control the power of plasma was really a major challenge. And uh, there was a seminal paper that was published in Nature, I believe, almost 20 years ago about the dream beam. So that was the very first time that a particle beam was successfully accelerated in a plasma. And at that time, people thought, this is the future because we can have much higher gradients. We can shrink down the size of accelerators. It's all going to be easier and cheaper. And we can all have accelerators everywhere. Now, it turns out the devil really lies in the detail because what you need for your experiments are beams of very high quality and with very specific properties. In particular, for your experiments, you would like to have a beam that is quite sharp in energy. So I showed you the plot about the particle beam as it goes into water and that for the patient treatment, we would like to have a distribution curve where we know that the particles unleash their energy at a particular distance. Now think about this for any experiment. If you want to collide two particle beams, you want to know what's going on in the experiment. And fundamentally, that's only possible um, if you know in quite some detail uh, the energy of that particle beam. Now, in plasma accelerators, that energy distribution was not very sharp. Um, in, indeed, it was something like 10%. Uh, so you never knew exactly what energy you had, but you had a very broad distribution of energies. And that, unfortunately, uh, was a criteria that did not allow to carry out many of the experiments that people wanted to do. And that's why radio frequency accelerators were just the only way to do these experiments. Now, today we are doing better. We have much better um, confined plasmas, much better controlled plasmas, and we can also produce beams um, that are more reproducible and that are much sharper in energy. And that latest evolution, the project that I showed, Eupraxia, that really is now the step to make, um, to build a particle accelerator um, for the first time based on plasma with reliable and reproducible beam properties that can give access to all of these applications and experiments. So the challenge really was uh, to kind of to manage the technology, the, the plasma technology, and, and that's what I like in the question, really was there. Everybody knew in principle we can use it, but it was just too difficult to control it to the extent that it was useful for science and applications. Excellent answer. So, Alan, so you will have a question. You're muted. So. You're muted. You're muted, Alan. I have so many questions. I, I'm I certainly <laughs> not going to get, get to all of them, but I, uh, I'm very uh, impressed by the uh, plasma curtain diagnostic that, that you showed. Um, is that visible light that you're, that you're imaging? Uh, from the uh, from the 
from the from the beam. Uh, remarkable. Are there other um, photons that are not captured, or are they potentially useful that come off? So the nice thing about this monitor is that we we have developed this over the last decade. So there's a very extensive R and D effort that. Um, is behind it and a few generations of PhD students and postdocs that have contributed to it. We can, depending on the particle beam, we either detect actually um, either the light generated by the beam or the electrons um, and ions that are created in the process okay. of that uh, collision. And then depending on the beam that you want uh, to analyze, whether it's an electron, an antiproton, a heavy ion, and the energy from KeV all the way to TeV, we can pretty much any particle beam that you have. And that is very interesting for high current applications where there's very limited diagnostic at the moment. Uh, so for us, uh, that is a uh, a new diagnostic that has the potential to be a game changer for these very demanding accelerator types where normal diagnostics simply do not work anymore. Fantastic. Okay. Um, it, may I follow up with an, a somewhat similar question It's based on my ignorance. Um, when you introduced AVA, uh, the a antimatter project, yes. uh, you, you, you showed this, um, uh, I guess I'd call it a logo, a very yeah. um, artistic uh, design on the, that. I believe you said it depicted a single antiproton colliding with a metal um, atom. Yeah. What all could that be? I mean, I, I, I have no insight other than maybe a few gammas coming off. Uh, as to what might come out of such a collision. Yeah, it, it is. It is not much more. So the there is a, there is an, a measurement that was done in the eighties, uh, which really has only a few trajectories, and then you see the the the, the, the spiral uh, sharp uh, shaped charged particle, and that was just style stylized um, for the purpose of the the cover of a booklet that we produced. But it is it is really a relatively simple reaction at low low energies. The name Ava actually the project is named after um, a little girl, Ava Scott, from Warrington here in England, um, uh, a young girl who sadly passed away um, a few years ago on, um, on childhood mm -hmm. cancer. And the project uh, helped us to raise a great awareness of childhood cancer and the need for new diagnostics and treatment techniques. We have been working very closely with Ava's family, and now we uh, we keep her name in, in very good memory and uh, and create awareness of the need to diagnose cancer earlier and uh, of innovative treatment technologies. Fantastic. Uh, Christine, it looks like you're poised to take, take some or pose some questions. No, but exactly. I think it's really important as well to link even also to the society that way. So uh, it's extremely good. So, and I know that in UK, so this is one of the important aspects. So, but now for the European side as well, or looking at uh, all the, um, yeah, for the plasma, uh, for the aspect as well with the wake field, there is a lot of development, exactly as you had uh, pointing out. So what's looking at also all the students, so you have a huge uh, quantity as well of students that you are also so supporting through all those uh, European grants. So what's the distribution somehow between um, all the different plasma, the medical physics? Can you give us a little view? And as well, to come to the, the question of the computational science, which I think it's a, yeah. an important part to develop. Yeah, let me take this in, in several steps. So, so firstly, uh, a very important um, point is that there are simply not enough trained accelerator scientists and engineers. Uh, there are not enough structured training programs. Hardly any university offers accelerator science at an undergraduate level. There are just a few that are very specialized that are offering this at all. And that means very often at large facilities like CERN, uh, like, like ESS, like many of the American national facilities, the people who then become the experts in a particular field of accelerator science, they have to be retrained on the job. So they may have started off as a particle physicist or nuclear scientist and then uh, learned hands-on 
what it takes to build and operate a machine. Um, so there is a there is a growing need actually for trained experts at a much earlier stage and the need for structured training program. At the moment, this is amplified very significantly um, by the race of AI. And uh, just at the moment, we are um, preparing um, an idea for a European or international consortium that looks into the use of artificial intelligence for accelerator optimization purposes. Uh, that really brings together the latest trends in data science, uh, the push for generative AI, uh, the need to develop instrumentation that is so-called virtual diagnostics, the, the need for adaptive machine models of an accelerator that basically take a reading of a diagnostics in an accelerator to live and in an ongoing way optimize the model of that accelerator. Uh, and that requires collaboration. It cannot be done by a single institute. And it also requires on, ongoing training. And it does require somebody looking into all these innovations that come from the research and then look into what are the wider markets that are available for this technology. And that is what's being shaped in a a uh, consortium that's called Artifact um, that is being uh, set up at the moment and where we are going to try and take the next step, a leap actually, um, into using data science and AI in the context of particle accelerators. So I guess watch this space. There's a lot uh, to come in that particular area. Exactly. And even this multidisciplinarity as well, that is important. So also to have a, a view on how those particle accelerators also could be a, a way through the data generation. So data that can really transcend. So it's really beyond accelerator. The problematic is similar. And indeed, whether we take from the synchrotron for the light source or the neutron source, we had as well the case uh, or the use also of neutron simulation, because the simulation and the um, noise background looking at data are quite often the same ways as well, the same type of method to look at. So I think, as you said, uh, that uh, this is really one way forward. And the, so the, the, the different community as well gathered around data. I, I think it's, it's an important uh, part as well. Uh, yep. So, yeah. Certainly. So it means that uh, it's the postdoc, uh, the um, students, when we think about UK, <laughs> UK being in Europe uh, geographically, <laughs> but looking at the European Union as well. So can you maybe recall us as well, the different uh, access for the students from Europe and with European project, with UK project, and how the mobility aspect is uh, feasible nowadays? Oh yeah, so one of, one of the really nice uh, programs for researcher training that exists um, is our so-called Marie Curie programs. Um, I think the philosophy behind uh, these programs, these doctoral networks, is that um, in order to be um, a very good researcher, international mobility is key in many areas. It probably um, is the case in accelerator science in particular because we are building very large machines and, and almost always in an international collaboration. You heard before that, uh, that uh, Christine lives in Sweden and she has uh, a French accent, so it's not her native country. You can tell from my accent uh, that I wasn't born in, in the UK. Uh, so lots of scientists, they move across borders. And I think the idea is uh, to really facilitate that at an early career stage, already at the doctoral training level. And Marie Curie, uh, fellowships, they actually, or doctoral networks, they actually require candidates to demonstrate international mobility. You cannot do a PhD in these programs in the same country that you have lived before for the last three years. You need to move to another country. You do that, and then you get a fantastic fellowship um, with excellent training opportunities embedded into an international network with many different organizations where you are doing secondments, you receive training through so schools and networks. And these Marie Curie networks, they are available in many different areas, and they are certainly one of the best ways of doing a PhD that exists anywhere around the world. Of course, there are many national schemes as well. There are PhD stipends in almost every country uh, where you can do funded PhD projects. Um, I think the, the, the really important step 
in doing a PhD compared to an undergraduate degree is uh, that one becomes an independent researcher. So one really has to solve problems themselves um, and, and find answers to questions where fundamentally at the beginning, nobody knows the answer. So a PhD project is not something where, which is designed like an undergraduate project where you need to find a certain value and then write up a thesis. No, it's an open question that somebody has to work on for several years of their life and where they become the leading expert and then they write this up. And that kind of training and qualification uh, that now uh, is taking shape in a number of structured programs in accelerator science to train the next generation of scientists and engineers. Christine, I know you have others uh, coming on board, but can I, I, I want to comment on that. I think there's a gap that we're not capturing in that uh, career development. Uh, clearly, the programs you've mentioned work for graduate uh, or, or undergraduate on up. But for people of, of the age of Erjan Alp and I, we had the advantage of our lives being basically dominated by accelerators, namely cathode ray tubes and, uh, and even vacuum tubes. Perhaps that 50,000 accelerators that you uh, cited, uh, Karsten, uh, may have peaked in the 1980s when CRTs were... <laughs> were yeah, absolutely, domain. absolutely, yes. But but the point is that there was a there was this um, there was the amateur scientist uh, column in Scientific American, where they published uh, actual doable science experiments, one of which was a sophisticated uh, MEV class um, accelerator, and right. I, I even even I did such a thing. I I, I built a Van de Graaff. I I couldn't master the, the vacuum techniques for the for the accelerator but but i think this launched a lot of kids into the direction of accelerator science back in the back in the bad old days but i don't see that anymore yeah. i don't see yeah. that no, you're, you're right yeah yeah so this is why we need to find ways to revivate as well all those different types yeah. So we have the, yeah, from the Big Bang Theory or, or beyond. And that's one of the things which is uh, also important. And indeed, so Alan, you come from the neutron world as well. So so that's also good for particles. So in general, I would say. So we need really to find ways to, to bring it as well to the common language. Mm. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm, I guess I'm speaking to the, um, um, those, uh, very early career people who who are destined to go into science or engineering anyway uh you know they 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 can be very fascinated by these topics if there is a way to uh uh you know connect them in and arjun has just commented that sesame is is doing something of that sort Exactly. So, so thanks a lot, Erkan. So to recall as well the Sesame project. So this is really also the, the idea as well of this platform to support uh, so the Sesame as well and to activate as well the different network around this uh, possibility as well to connect the people. So there are so many assets uh, with uh, so this science in general. Yeah, I think Sesame is a good example of where other accelerators help to build another accelerator. So it has received incredible amount of collaboration and cooperation from European and, and around the world. And so accelerators are exciting projects in that sense, people want to come in and help build another one. Exactly. Right. So, That's me. Good example. So we have uh, now Stefan. So Stefan Kenmo, who could uh, raise his question. Yeah, uh, thanks, Christine. Uh, Karsten, this is Stefan from Duisburg SL University. So hello. I <laughs> hello. I just have a, a very, I mean, geopolitical question. It's about uh, capacity building and then also infrastructures. So uh, people like Christine has been have been involved in capacity building in high energy physics and stuff related to what you presented today on the continent in Africa, for example, but as far as I understand, it's a more theoretical and more uh, about possibilities to come to Europe or to in the US to 
I mean, to continue research or develop their career. Since I know that you have been involved in many pan European projects and also in America, all over the world, do you are you aware of any initiative dedicated to the construction of the first ever light source on the continent? You know, I once talked to Fabiola Janotti from CERN, and I yes. asked her how it worked so that they ended up uh, building the sesame, I mean, this accelerator for the Middle East. And then I asked her about what do you think about Africa? And then I could not understand her answer. It was about uh, okay, every continent has to first initiate the will to have something. And then CERN comes with maybe advice or stuff like that. So. Have you ever heard about people, scientists, or anybody in the world talking about something for Africa? Or so, well, there, there are there are accelerators facilities in in South Africa, not light source. Um, to be, uh, you, you're absolutely right. Um, I I think politically that is definitely something uh, that needs to continue to be explored uh, because what these facilities are doing. Um, is uh, they not only give uh, research capability, they also bring together and build a community of investigators. Uh, the moment you have a light source, you um, attract people um, in, into that particular facility. You, you build up various user communities from the detectors to the data analysis all the way to the experimentalists conducting the experiment. So it's a, a very good um, opportunity to bring communities together. I do believe that there was um, an African light source project um, um, some some time ago. I'm not I'm not aware of where exactly that stands uh, but it is true for any region um, around the world uh, is that these kind of infrastructures that have a combined research and user facilities character they drive innovation and they drive scientific process they are also a beacon for the young people to 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 have something that they can aspire to become part of uh, so it's, it's clearly something that we need to continue to push now in terms of accessing information the MOOC that we talked about beforehand is a fantastic step um, to um, learn about accelerators. There are also courses that are made accessible to anyone around the world. For example, my group has developed a beam instrumentation training, uh, which is basically um, a school in a box. So uh, you can register for the school and then we send you a kit um, where you can do beam instrumentation experiments uh, in the comfort of your living room and you learn about particle accelerators and how you diagnose a particle beam and you don't need any prior knowledge uh, and you learn the fundamentals of position measurement, profile measurement, all of these things. And the idea is that this could happen anywhere and especially in remote locations where there is no accelerator close by because it's always easy to live in a region in the world where there are all of these infrastructures and you just go there and you learn how to do it. But what if you aren't anywhere close? Can you still learn it? And the answer is yes, absolutely, either through the MOOC or through something which is a working at home course um, or through online seminars. So I guess being connected today to this colloquium is a fantastic start, but there's just so much more to explore. So thanks a lot. This is the perfect answer to see how nowadays uh, with the virtual world as well, so we can connect. Uh, and Correct. for the, the reality as well of the African light source, so I, I just showed the link. And as uh, so I can oh, yeah. yes, there is uh, this project. Uh, and now so far, the, the phase is the CDR, so the, the conceptual design uh, report, which is being completed. So we had last uh, September 22, so also a full uh, session dedicated, so a colloquial from uh, um, to Professor Simon Connell, so you can revisit as well that. Uh, and uh, like the Sesame, like the African light source, or like the Great Caribbean as well, light source, those uh, uh, different initiatives are something that gather as well the different community. But as you said, it's also all those different equipment that needs to be as well developed and own by those given also country to be able to be operated as well in one way. So there are many, many ways indeed to, to create uh, those synergies and to enable that. So thanks a lot, Stefan, for, for this question. It's very important. And as you, you know, so Stefan, uh, so we had uh, with the African uh, physical uh, school, the, the African school of physics. Uh, so it's fundamental physics, but also far beyond because we want to address uh, the problematic in Africa that can be also a lot with condensed matter, a lot with all those user case. This is why 
um, this MOOC for accelerated teaching, we try as well to have an overall view. So where society will need accelerator. And of course, I can only cut also what we say there that one third of the Nobel Prize in physics and chemistry are enabled thanks to particle accelerator. So there is a lot that, that particle accelerator can do, but it's knowledge as well, mainly that needs to be enhanced. So, so thanks mm -hmm. a lot for enabling also all the, the different students so to become the leader also of tomorrow. And uh, those programs, the Marie Curie, as you said, in America and with America, I think it's it's also important. But also the um, in Japan, in Asia, so we had compact accelerator also presented. So in August, uh, and that was I think an excellent capacity as well for us to show how collaboration, international collaboration, can work for the goods as well of physics, and looking how as well to. Uh, build up smaller compact source as well that could enable as well easier energy. So, so there are a lot that, again, particle accelerator can do. So thanks a lot for all those aspects. So maybe one more, or maybe Stefan, you have uh, your hand is raised. So I don't know. You want no, to? No, uh, so sorry, I forgot to. <laughs> no, like okay. I say, yeah. okay. So we... Cheers. Well, many, many thanks in any case for all of these wonderful questions. It was, was great to have so much passion and interest in accelerator science. So thanks a lot. So, Alan, one last question or we finish? Well, I, I would just like to thank Karsten. That uh, was such a well-prepared talk and uh, it, it communicates at the right level. Mm -hmm. um, it shows a lot of thought. It's a kind of example the paradigm that we should uh, carry forward in um, in all of our public outreach thanks so thanks a lot Carson so international so as you said so that's fundamental so thank Perfect. you well, thanks. thanks for organizing and uh, wish all of you all the best thank you thank thanks you. a lot Carson so I simply, before we finish, then pass uh, uh, the view for our next uh, uh, presentation. So which will be as well on uh, science in general. So looking how interaction as well between physics, environmental, and uh, the development issues can be uh, tackled. So this is a serious and complex uh, aspect. And uh, so Professor George Ellis, live from South Africa, uh, will give us uh, so all those answers. And he has been also writing books uh, that uh, you will find certainly very interesting. So thank you everyone for attending and uh, we will then be able to stay tuned and to have uh, uh, much more, so more time to talk. Bye-bye, uh. yeah. you and me. Bye-bye. Bye. Nice to see you guys. Bye.